our program today, today for our program, we welcome back uh, old friend. Uh, this is Cynthia Clampett, who we uh, last heard from All About Pigs, and we love that program, so we can't wait to see her today. Uh, Karen Pulver is going to introduce Cynthia Clampett, so Karen, to you. Well, welcome back, um, everybody. Good to see you. Um, so after her rave reviewed performance with us last January, which is one of our last live meetings at the fortnightly, Cynthia Clampett really needs very little introduction. But to review, Cynthia is a food historian and her academic background has led her to research seemingly esoteric topics, or at least I kind of feel like it. Um, but with those that research, she has um, done in-depth studies and turned these ideas into very readable books. And as we know, she's a very passionate speaker. Um, so who knew that corn and rum and pigs could be so very, very captivating. Now, perfect timing. Who doesn't want to go on a trip? Um, and I know, I know people are planning to take off. So Cynthia's latest book is called Destination Heartland. And if you listen to her today and read her books, then you will find out about the many attractions in our wider backyard. So welcome back, Cynthia. Thank you very much, Karen. Delighted to be here. So let's see. How do I, ah, here we go. I was going to say wanted to take over from you guys, because you have your, your thing in too. So anyway, Destination Heartland History. Um, the original name of the book, the, the book will not be out because the University of Illinois has decided that nobody will be traveling this year. Um, so they postponed the book till next year. So this will give you a jump start on both the book and the adventure. And uh, just anyway, it's like it says, exploring the remarkable history of a remarkable region. It's uh, much underappreciated. Now, here we go. Start first of all. I should mention too that it's like the Midwest is. It is so American that it's hard to talk about America without talking about the Midwest. Um, the American icons from Wyatt Earp to the Wright brothers, Buffalo Bill to Henry Ford. I mean, it's just almost everything that's happened in the Midwest has, or in the United States, has happened in the Midwest. Um, in fact. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that Europe comes up to the Allegheny Mountains, America starts west of that. Uh, now, the region that we call the Midwest today started out as the Northwest Territory. Now, the Northwest Territory, which is the, the green one um, there on the map, uh, the Northwest Territory was a region that was won from France during the French and Indian War, won by Britain. Then the King of England said that nobody in, in the, you know, on the e colonies could move into this territory. Now, first of all, to tell you know why it's called the Northwest Territory is because it's north of the Ohio River. It's west of the colonies and north of the Ohio River. For a short time, there was a Southwest Territory, but that lasted for like two years before they named the Southern states. But the Northwest Territory is north of the Ohio River and west of the colonies. Okay. Um, sorry, my slideshow's not showing? No. Oh, okay. Let's see. Escape. Share screen. Okay, because we did this before and it worked. Share. That's showing there up now? Go. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you for saying something. Um, play from start. Okay. So now you can see what I was saying with the title. Okay, so here we go, the Northwest Territory. Um, it's one of the reasons why the biggest reenactment group in this region is known as the Northwest Territory Alliance because that was the original Midwest. And yes, you can see that gave us once, once the American Revolution was over and people were no longer prevented from moving into this territory, um, it gave us Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and just Michigan and just a smidge of Minnesota. Um, so that was the original Northwest Territory. Then in 1803, Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, once again, um, the part that was north of the line that came from across from, um, from the Ohio River, because the Ohio River ends at the Mississippi, but they sort of followed that line across and 
Kansas moving upwards, all of that became the new Northwest Territory. And then the old Northwest Territory, the original Northwest Territory became known as the old Northwest Territory. Well, that started getting confusion, having, confusing, having the old Northwest and the new Northwest. Um, they wanted something else to talk about, uh, even as they came up with states, they wanted another way to describe it. Now, the area of Nebraska and Kansas, if you look at it, is right sort of between the Northwest Territory and the Mexican Southwest Territory. And that's what Midwest means, is it means between the Northwest and the Southwest. It doesn't mean from coast to coast, even though Nebraska and Kansas are dead center. There are people who say, oh, Nebraska and Kansas aren't really part of the Midwest, but in fact, they were the first two states to be called the Midwest. So we don't really have a Midwest without Kansas and Nebraska. Um, the name Corn Belt started in Ohio and moved west. The name Midwest started in Nebraska and Kansas and moved east. So that's where we, there's, that's why we're the Middle West is because we're between the North and the South. Okay, let's see which button works, that works. And sometimes we're called flyover territory. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is if you do fly over, you can look down and in the late 1700s, Thomas Jefferson had them surveying the land into uh, squares that were six miles to a side, which are now what we call townships. And if you fly over, you can look down. And I mean, this was just a bunch of guys with chains going out and measuring all of this. And if you look down even today, remarkable of you know, how straight the lines are and how perfect the, the squares are. And that's why the Midwest looks like it does from the sky. But it is far from being flyover territory. There are a lot of reasons to land here. Now, of course, we're famous for our plains, um, almost endless. Here you see trees. The trees in the distance have all been planted by, by settlers. So it was described as being kind of like the ocean by a lot of the settlers. And some people were kind of unsettled by the fact that it was so open. But they're restoring lots of it. Um, if you want to see a lot of the prairie, Kansas is the place to go because there are tons and tons of, um, you know, well, millions of acres. It's the largest uninterrupted grassland in the country. So we've grown for the plains, but we also have fabulous forests. The, nor the great north woods are unbelievably beautiful. Um, here you see a lot of the deciduous uh, trees um, and a lot of the, the darker, you know, the darker green is, is in the minority, but we have a lot of the pine trees. We have fabulous forests of birch. Uh, it's just really glorious trees in the Midwest. Um, this one is actually in Michigan. The thing that one of the things that makes us more outrageously um, endowed, shall we say, is not in fact mountains. People tend to think of mountains as scenery, but we own we pretty much own water. Um, the Mississippi River is one of the biggest rivers in the world. People who first arrived at the side of the Mississippi thought it must be a lake because it was so huge. There is nothing in Europe comparable to the Mississippi. Um, the Indian word Mississippi means big river or water, father of waters. And that's where we got the name for the Mississippi was the Ojibwa word. So that, and then of course, the Great Lakes. This is Lake Michigan. It looks like the ocean. When they first reached the Great Lakes, they thought they had reached the ocean. One fifth of the world's fr fresh water is in these lakes, so we're impressive. You know, we may not have Mount, you know, Mount Rainier, but we are an impressive region. We also have fabulous things besides plains and forests. Um, this is Starved Rock in Illinois. This is Monument Rocks in Iowa. Um, this is just oh Kansas, sorry. So there are lots of places, of course, that have cool rocks, and so. What I want to focus on from here on out is the stuff that the Midwest has that nobody else does. Now, every single state has fabulous stuff to see, and I will be sort of skimming over a lot of the states just because there is so much to see. And this lecture is only about one quarter of what's in the book, and what's in the book is only about one tenth of what's available, which is why there's an entire chapter in the book on how to find more stuff because there is so much fabulous stuff to see in this region. Um, what I've divided this lecture up into is different ways of seeing and pursuing that history. And the first, the first section is themes or interests. 
for me, Native Americans were always just in a massively important uh, area of interest ever since I was a little girl. Um, here we have a painting of Cahokia, it, which is in Illinois. Interestingly enough, Cahokia was not built by the Cahokia Indians. Cahokia was built by a Mississippian culture. It was named by the French for the Native Americans they met in, when they arrived in the 16, late 1600s. So it has nothing to do with the Cahokia Indians um, other than they lived nearby. But this is a gigantic place that was actually had a population in 1200, had a population greater than that of London. So it was, it was an impressive culture. Uh, that huge, enormous um, prominence that you see in the center is called Monk's Mound, and it's the largest earthwork in the New World. And here it is today. So there is still a lot left to look at. Um, just a remarkable, remarkable place. Oh, I should also point out um, over on the far left, if you're looking at your screen, you'll see a circle, and that's known as Wood Hinge. And just like Stonehenge, uh, it was a way of, of tra tra you know, tracking the year, tracking the times and the seasons and everything else. So always fascinating to see things appear in completely different parts of the world that reflect things from, you know, from Europe or wherever. So, oh, and that river, um, the big river you see on the left is the Mississippi. So if you're planning a trip to St. Louis, it's very easy to just pop over to Cahokia. And lots and lots of mounds of the 120 original mounds, about 90 are left. Um, the Mississippian culture was here between 700 to 1350 um, AD. And this is one of the things that's fun too, is all these places really want you to find and explore. So this is from their website, from the Cahokia website. It shows you all the possible walks and all the things to see. And for me, the, one of the most important things after you've seen the mounds is to go and see the interpretive center because the interpretive center has done an absolutely stunning job of recreating the life. They have a wonderful movie about the, uh, the, the Indians that lived at Cahokia, about the, the existence of Cahokia. They have uh, things that have been dug up, but they also have recreations of just life as it occurred back then. And of course, being a food historian, I was attracted to um, some of the food things. So here's a recreation of, and this is just right in the middle of the museum though, a canoe filled with mussels because mussels were a huge part of the diet pecans, which are indigenous to the, the region, um, and some sun chokes, because that was really popular too. So a lot of food. Um, and then here we are skipping, it's just leapfrogging. Like I said, this is going to be a, a whirlwind tour of the Midwest. Uh, this is up to um, prehistoric Indian village in Mitchell, South Dakota. One of the things people do is almost everybody goes to Mitchell, South Dakota to see the Corn Palace, looks at the Corn Palace and leaves. And there's so much more to see in Mitchell, including this, the Archaeodome. The Archaeodome was designed based on the dome over the Terracotta Army in China. And for the same reason, and that is to protect the dig. So you can walk into the Archaeodome, you can see the lab in the background where they do all the work and you can actually see the dig. So they can dig year round, which is really good in South Dakota because they have long winters. But so far, uh, more than one and a half million artifacts have been excavated just from this one site. Uh, the, basically all the evidence suggests that, I mean, they moved north by 100 or 1000 um, AD. So they were gone long before Europeans arrived. They believe that these were in fact the uh, forebears of the Mandan that, that Lewis and Clark met 800 years later. Um, but they believe they're Mississippian. So here's the different, you know, some of the pottery that's decorated that gives them the idea that this was Mississippian. Of course, there are extensive trade networks. So it's always hard to completely be certain that what you're looking at reflects the Native American group. But this just shows you some idea of the trade routes uh, that, that centered on the Midwest. And here is a reconstruction of one of their houses. Right next to the Archaeodome, there's a wonderful museum um, that has a great deal more information and a movie and a lot more artifacts, that 1.5 million artifacts that were found at the dig. 
uh, plus a reconstruction of what the house was like. And the thing that's interesting is when you go north and you see the Mandan houses, they're very, very similar. Now, you don't have to necessarily go to South Dakota. This is the Mitchell Museum in uh, Evanston. So this is really close at hand. There are a lot of smaller museums that are worthwhile. I tended to focus on ones that were a little more out of the way, but this one's right in uh, downtown Evanston, lovely museum. One of the things worth noting is when you go to museums that focus on American Indians, uh, and interestingly enough, it's like most people will write Native Americans, but most Native Americans call themselves American Indians. Um, most of the sites that focus on American Indians want to make sure you understand that even though their history is interesting, they're still here. So there are always a lot of exhibits showing um, currently famous Native Americans, actors, ballerinas, artists. Um, so, so it will always be a combination and usually the focus is on Native Americans since the time of first contact. Um, but there's always a considerable amount of overlap um, between past and present. Now here we are um, in the Oneida Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I mean, literally, there's nowhere you can go that you're not going to run into a great museum. Um, this is uh, um, Oneida people, and it's once again, like the Mitchell Museum, it does past up through the present. Um, this is obviously a really old uh, hut. This is the, They had the long houses where a dozen families or so lived together, but they also focus on how they've been involved in a society since then. Um, this is, I thought was very interesting. When you talk about code talkers, most people think of the Navajo immediately, but the Oneida were also code talkers. So they were not, you know, it was not just the Navajo. Um, you can see the medals, you can see, you know, obviously the pictures here, um, but interestingly, it's not just World War II. The Oneida have actually fought side by side with American forces all the way back to George Washington. So the Oneida have a long history uh, with, with American military. And now here we are skipping to Minnesota. This is Mill Lac. Mill Lac is French for Thousand Lakes. Um, there's actually a huge lake behind this called Mill Lac Lakes. And the thing that's interesting is this is actually on the Mill Lac Reservation. It's, it's Ojibwe. Interestingly, Ojibwe and Chippewa are both different renderings of what is essentially the same name and yet the Native Americans that call themselves Ojibwa are not the same as the Native Americans that call themselves Chippewa, even though it's basically the same group of people. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. So you'll see Ojibwa and then Paran Chippewa about half of the time that you see the, the name mentioned at all. Now this trading post is, it offers the largest range of Native American crafts of any sort in Minnesota, even though there's a lot of um, Native Americans in Minnesota still, especially up in the areas where you can harvest wild rice. But the nice thing about this too is this is your clue that you've actually reached this, the museum, because there's not a sign here, but this is the Mill, Leak, Mill Lock Indian Museum. Uh, it is Ojibwa and Chippewa, and it has, you know, it's a beautiful museum. I loved a lot of the stuff. This is, a, according to their history, this is where the jingle dress was invented. If you've ever been to a Native American powwow, you will have heard the ladies dancing in the jingle dresses. Um, originally, the jingles were all made from the lids of um, chewing tobacco cans, but they just get the sheets of aluminum now to make the jingle dresses. But this was invented here in Mill Lock on the reservation in 1919. So it's just over a hundred years old. Fabulous displays all through the museum of history timelines that take you from when they first arrived in 1750 up to the present day. But my favorite part was what they call the Four Seasons Room. And the Four Seasons Room creates the life of the Ojibwe uh, from you know from from the 1600 or from the 1700s rather um, during each of the four important seasons this is the spring which is maple sugar season so you can see them in the background tapping the trees you can see them stirring the maple syrup um, so this is the season when and you could tell that this is 1750s 
contact with Europeans had already occurred, which is why you have the iron pots hanging there instead of just doing it in, in a wooden trough. So um, one of the things that makes this particularly interesting is every single Native American represented in these rooms actually was modeled on somebody who lives on the reservation. So they can come in, people come in, bring their families in, and people can recognize the people in these displays. They, they, there's grandfather, there's grandmother, there's you know the kids. So, so every one of these represents somebody who actually was on the reservation at the time. This is the uh, summer where they're harvesting wild rice and catching and drying fish. Um, so this is, a, I really love, one of the things they said is fun is that they have 13 different animals, stuffed animals around the room. And that's one of the things they tell kids to do when they visit is to try and find all 13 of the animals. So there's like a, a Arctic hare, you know, a winter, an Arctic hare in its winter coat and an owl and all sorts of different animals for them to find. So that's one of the things that's nice is all these museums as fascinating as they are for adults always have some element that's designed for the kids too. So if you're taking kids or grandkids there's always something for them to do. Okay, now this is a museum right here, just down near Joliet. Um, this is one that starts to show the beginning of the Native American and European overlap. This is Il Alakash, uh, which is basically the island where you hide stuff, which is where the voyageurs would come down the Des Plaines River and they would stop at this island and hide things while they were uh, traveling perhaps food for the return trip uh, inside. And this is a little museum. I mean, this is, you don't need to give yourself more than an hour or so. Some of these places take quite a bit of time, but this one's a little one, but it's really rich. And it shows the overlap of the cultures. Um, that canoe is actually a reproduction of a voyageur's canoe, which was the voyageurs by this time were imitating Native American culture. But then you see above it, you see the rifle, which is from Europe, but then you see the tomahawk, which would be from the Native Americans. Um, at this time, it was still seen as a tremendously beneficial to both groups. And so there's a uh, lot of great information science in these places. And that just so you know, is the criterion for the places I picked is they, they aren't just old places, they're places where you can learn stuff. But this showed basically how um, Native Americans loved trading with the Europeans. The Europeans wanted to get the furs, but the Native Americans wanted knives and iron pots and fabric because they had only skins up until then. So they were getting fabric, they were getting tools, they were getting all these other things that were completely um, unavailable to them otherwise. And so, so trade, was, trade was part of their culture for more than a thousand years. So the idea of trade wasn't new. It was who they were trading with. And at this point, the trade was incredibly uh, lucrative to both sides as far as they were concerned. Um, but, you know, it kept getting bigger, the trade kept getting bigger and the French started coming more and more stuff was being shipped. At this point, the spice trade is beginning to bring things over. And so you can see the growing of the, of the trade until you get to the point where there's just too many people. And that led to the first settlements in this region. Um, this goes back to uh, seven, well, the current 1719 is when um, St. Genevieve started. St. Genevieve is south of, of St. Louis in Missouri. St. Genevieve was the patron saint of Paris. So it gave you some idea of what kind of ambition they had as they were settling this place. Um, a beautiful town. The whole place is just absolutely remarkable. Um, they did have to move it because the river kept flooding. So 1785 is when they moved it here, but they moved all the original buildings. So most of this stuff is, uh, you know, 300 years old. So it's a, a largest concentration, and that's the thing that's interesting. This is the largest cr concentration of French Creole um, homes in the U.S. So there's more Creole homes here than even in New Orleans. And New Orleans uh, basically relied on this region. You know, we tend to think just of trade, but by 1700, um, they were farming this area. And just so the amount of wheat, this was actually known as the breadbasket of New Orleans. So this supplied all the food. It's a, it's a beautiful place to visit if you get a chance. Fabulous B&Bs, fabulous restaurants, um, and fascinating, fascinating places. This is Bulldog House. 
And this is an example. This is one of the ones that, that is not being lived in anymore. Uh, oddly, or interesting enough, a lot of the older homes are still lived in. The guide I hired for the day actually was born in one of these houses. Um, so there are still people living in some of them, but some of them have been uh, set aside for preservation. This is the Bolduc house. And the thing that makes it quite remarkable is that it's one of many in this town, um, vertical log houses. The log houses, the logs went up and down rather than sideways. Now, the thing that made that interesting, um, to me anyway, is if you've ever heard about the New Madrid Fault and all the earthquakes that took place here in the 1800s, um, unlike log houses where the logs are stacked, the logs are upright. So they just waved from side to side instead of rolling off onto the ground. So all of these houses survived the New Madrid Fault. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that this is surprisingly, and they, they would have whitewashed that wall. They've left the wall stripped so that you can see the, the construction. But these were really nice houses. Um, this, was, this was the frontier, but they were getting very wealthy, supplying all the food for um, New Orleans. So surprisingly lovely. But now sort of moving from here, the little transition to the next theme, there are better restaurants in St. Genevieve than the old brick house, but the old brick house is the oldest brick building west of the Mississippi, built in 1785. So of course, I had to stop there because A, I like old stuff and I like old restaurants and I like, well, the oldest place in, in the, you know, the oldest place this side of the Mississippi. So, um, or no, this is the other, yeah, the other side of the Mississippi. So. Anyway, this sort of leads into the next theme, which for me is restaurants. I like old places. I'm a food historian. So um, Village Tavern, if you get to Long Grove, I mean, that's the thing is I think we sometimes forget that a lot of really old stuff is right nearby. Um, Riverside in Chicago is, is a National Historic Site. Uh, there are wonderful museums here too, but the Village Tavern, Long Grove is this wonderful old German town that has been preserved um, still one lane roads, co you know, covered bridges. Uh, the buildings all now have um, more traditional uh, stores in them. You know, they're not selling stuff that you would have bought in the 1800s. But the Village Tavern um, is the oldest restaurant in Illinois. Uh, it was built in 18, oh, yeah, 1847. So it's the oldest restaurant in Illinois, has a wonderful interior. Um, they still do things the old fashioned way, you know, everything's hand done, hand cut steaks and everything else. But it's just, it's a wonderful little place to go back and find a little bit of history. This is the stage stop in Wilmot, Wisconsin. So just over the border. So you don't have to go very far. Uh, this is 1848. This is the oldest tap and dining room in Wisconsin. Um, the ground floor is where the restaurant is remains to this day. The upper two floors, are now museums. That would have been, because it was on the stagecoach route from Geneva to Kenosha, which is, that's the other thing about looking at the history of the Midwest is being reminded that the history, the cities that are important now are not necessarily the cities that were important then. Geneva was like the center of the universe. Kenosha was really important. So this was on the route between Geneva and Kenosha. Um, so, Downstairs is the dining room. Upstairs was a ballroom and a pool parlor. And the top floor was all accommodations for people who were traveling by road. And you can go upstairs and it's all been transformed into a museum. So you can go upstairs and learn more about um, the stagecoach route, what life was like. They have billiard tables that were built, bought in the 1800s and brought from the East Coast. So, uh, and you can have a really good dinner a classic Wisconsin dinner with lots and lots of butter and sour cream. And then this one, this is the Hayes House, 1857. This is the oldest continuously operating restaurant west of the Mississippi. But this is one of those places where, as you find so often, the history is just more than just the obvious. It's not just that it's an old restaurant. Um, it was built by Seth Hayes, who was Daniel Boone's grandson. So he was the first white person to come out here. He was sent to ne negotiate with the Kansas Indians. And if you can't guess, Kansas Indians is where we get the name of Kansas. 
So he came out to negotiate. So he was the first white person in this area. Um, he built this restaurant because the when the Santa Fe Trail came through, it went right through here. And that if you could see that sign at the right there, the little red sign on the veranda, that's the one that says you're on the Santa Fe Trail. So that, that is actually the Santa Fe Trail right in front of it. So you've got, oh, and besides being the grandson of Daniel Boone, he was the cousin of Kit Carson. So it's just one of those, how many layers of history can you fit into one place? Um, so anyway, and then Glur Tavern, this is in Columbus, uh, Nebraska. This was where Buffalo Bill used to hang out. And uh, the idea of just, anyway, it's still a fun restaurant. They have lots of displays inside and everything, but you can actually see it's like it says on the sign, National Historic Site, but you can still go in and they have um, a meal. It's pretty much, one of the things I have found with all of these places is the historic restaurants, the food suits their previous life. So a posh restaurant in 1800 is still a posh restaurant today. A tavern from the 1800s is in fact, still more of a tavern grub place today. So they have beer and burgers. So it's just that they obviously can't be serving exactly what they served back then, but they still match it to, to what the you know, original um, purpose was. Now, living history. This is one of my favorite things. I love living history. I love reenactments. There are fabulous living history venues in, this, in the Midwest. Um, it pretty much got kickstarted when Williamsburg was starting to become important. And that's when everybody went, hey, we have history too, let's jump on this. So there are fabulous living history venues all over the Midwest. I think every state has a great one. Um, this is from um, Sauter Village in Northern Ohio. This is the largest living history venue in Ohio. That's the other thing is a lot of states have multiple living history venues. Um, now, the thing that makes a living history venue a living history venue, other than just a museum, is there are interpreters. There are people who are dressed, in this case, as a trapper. So he's a trapper that, uh, from the French voyageur days. Um, the voyageurs adopted pretty much the dress and customs of the Native Americans because it made it very easy to survive in the wilderness. Um, so this is, uh, he's in the newcomers section of this, this uh living history venue. And this interpreter is demonstrating making butter in one of the old houses. That's the other thing too, is these are not copies of our old houses. These are really, really old places. They are brought here rather than being torn down because there's so much that we learn from you know, the things that we find in there, the, the way people lived. Uh, so this is still Sauter Village. And here's another interpreter doing fancy woodwork in the cabinet maker shop. That's the other thing is the interpreters are actually doing real stuff. Um, for instance, at one of the one of the venues I visited, they had a, a farrier. Now what a farrier is, because we tend to think of the blacksmith as being every place and pretty much all of these places will have a blacksmith. But if a town had money and a good sized population, you would have a blacksmith and a farrier because a blacksmith would make tools and the farrier would shoe horses. So you never had this, you know, you, you always had a farrier and they actually have a full-time farrier in, in, in one of the ones in Nebraska where that's his job is he does all the shoes, all the horses. So there's a constant stream of horses coming through um, that sort of lend a, a certain amount of verisimilitude to it. But here we have somebody making beautiful wooden things in the cabinet shop. Uh, here we go. Uh, this one is in Nebraska. This is the Stir Museum of the Prairie Pioneer. Um, this is the railroad town. And the thing that made it a railroad town, because that's the thing is none of these museums duplicate exactly what it was that you find at the other living history museums because the histories of each of these states is slightly different. Now, what a railroad town was is as the railroad was built across the West, the railroad company would say, okay, it's been 10 miles since we had a town, there will be a town here. And they would lay it out, they would name it, and then they would advertise for people to move in. Um, this is how we got Wichita, this is how we got Abilene, this is how we got a lot of the towns that became iconic across Nebraska and Kansas. So this was a town that started out, the buildings were would have originally been built to house all of the workers for the railroads. So 
this reproduces that, which is the early town on the train rat track that was built by the railroad. And so everything in the, in the town is within a few yards of a train. And then this one is the living history farms in Iowa. Now, the reason they are the living history farms is because they have three different farms. The first farm is 1750 and it's a Native American farm. The second one is 1850 and it's a pioneer farm. And this is from the 1900s farm, which is the, uh, the modern farm. This is the farm where uh, it, it's what we think of when we see, think of farms. It's the red barns, it's the upright silo. Um, by 1900, and this may not look terribly modern to you, but having horses do the work was a huge advance. The uh, equipment was nimble enough that you could use the speed of the, uh, and the agility of the horse rather than the brute strength of oxen. So this was, this was considered kind of a, breaky, you know, a, a break in the development of farming. Um, but like I said, once again, you have people reproducing what life was like. Now this is probably this, I always think of this like the granddaddy of all the living history venues um, is Greenfield Village. Now Greenfield Village is part of a huge complex. Uh, next door is the um, Henry Ford Museum. The Henry Ford Museum is uh, of, of American inventions and it's, uh, it covers 12 acres. The museum is huge um, and it's mostly inventions and stuff, but the um, Greenfield Village Basically, it's just astonishing the things that Henry Ford collected here. He, this is not a reproduction. This is the Wright Brothers bicycle shop. Right next door is the house that the Wright Brothers was born in. He also has his family's farm. He has the, the Goodyear farm. He has um, George Washington Carver's slave cabin. He has, I mean, there are hundreds, it covers 85 acres. There are hundreds and hundreds of uh, buildings here that are actually the buildings that they were, you know, that, that, that are part of American history. The reason I liked this particular picture is I think it underscores the impact of the Midwest because you have the Wright Cycle Company, the guys who invented the airplane. They were from Ohio, by the way. People tend to associate them with North Carolina because they went there for the wind coming off the ocean, but they were from Ohio. Um, and today, most of the airplanes in the country are built in Wichita, Kansas, so basically, and Chicago is the busiest airport. So the Midwest owns aviation, but you've got the airplane and you've got the Model T car, which made cars affordable for everybody. So um, there's, there's the history of the United States right there, cars and airplanes. Oops, wrong direction, here we go. But there's huge numbers of buildings there in addition to the ones that are iconic, the ones that belong to famous people. They have recreated, um, all of the buildings necessary for life in the cities. You have the buildings that were sawmills, the buildings that were grain grinders, the buildings that were used by farmers. Um, you can, it, just the amount of work you can see done here, tinsmiths making objects out of tin, um, restaurants serving food from the 1700s. So definitely if you can possibly get to Greenfield Village and the Henry Ford, uh, give yourself a couple of days. Some of these places you can blitz in and out in an hour. Here you're going to want two or three days. Uh, and here we have one of the reenactors pulling up horseradish. He says, if you don't get rid of the horseradish, it will completely take over your garden. Now here we have in Illinois again, um, this is Lincoln's New Salem. Uh, this is such a spectacular place. It's so beautiful. Um, and, you know, just to underscore the importance of this, it's not just important that you guys know about this. It's important that people start going to these places as soon as you can, because they're all hurting terribly. And we don't want to lose this heritage. But anyway, this was what Lincoln thought he would do initially was open a store. Um, he was not good at it. And so that's why he started uh, doing you know, the law, studying the law and getting into other things because he, he failed with, this is the first store. And then he had a second store and that failed too. So anyway, this is Abraham Lincoln. This is where he realized that he wanted to study law and where he first got involved in politics, but it's really gorgeous. And uh, just the flowers and the, the buildings and absolutely worth seeing and indoors too. I mean, everything is recreated and there are, are people interpreting this, making ink and writing and 
And then here's another one of my favorites. And one of the reasons I love this one, um, this is up in, in uh, Minnesota. Uh, this is the um, Forest History Center. And that's the thing is we think, we tend to think in terms of the Midwest supplying food for everybody. And we are really good at that. We supply, you know, we are the bread basket. We do supply the, a lot of food. We're the corn belt, the hog belt, but we supplied so much more. We supplied almost all the stone that built the country because there are quarries everywhere. Most of the metal, because there are um, huge mines everywhere. You could go up to the iron range, which basically all of New York was built by, by metal mined in, in Michigan. Um, Michigan also supplied pretty much all the copper need for all the cannons during the Civil War. But Minnesota is where the trees came from. And this is the uh, Midwest or the, the Forest History Center in Grand Rapids, uh, Minnesota. That's the other thing is that you find out that anything that has the name Rapids or Falls in it, that's why the place was settled because that was your source of energy for much of history was you needed running water to, to make things run. So this is, there's more than one Grand Rapids. This is in Minnesota, not Michigan, uh, at the head of the Mississippi River. Um, this is the barn boss. Uh, teams of horses were used to move the huge loads. Now, one of the things they explained is the reason they worked in the winter, because they always worked in the winter. That's why we associate lumberjacks with cold weather. Um, is because A, all the farmers were available. It's like their fields had been harvested. And so the farmers were all available to work. But the other big reason is if you pour water all over the road, then the horses, you can slide the, the, the load and horses can pull um, 20 tons if they're sliding it on ice. And so for delivering, delivering wood to market, this was, this was why it had to happen in the winter. Fabulous buildings. Um, this is the living quarters, two men to a bunk, which kept you from freezing to death but they had a problem with lice, of course. Here's the kitchen. That was one of the things they said is that the, uh, a good cook was more important even than pay for, for making sure you got enough people to work for you um, in, in these lumber camps because they, they needed to eat a huge amount of food. And that was the other thing too, is it was the, and, and this would be the cook would be the second highest paid job after the, the boss. So this was actually a place where women could come in and make a substantial amount of money, more money than all the men that were out of working there. And that was the other thing, push, push is the boss and you start to learn the lingo, the sky pilot is the preacher and the dentist is the guy who fixes the teeth on the saws. So, and here's the table. You sat down, you were not allowed to talk, you had 15 minutes to eat and they ate a lot. And then this is the thing that was interesting to me too, is that it is winter and in winter up this far north, it's a really short day. And so they said the working day was can see to can't see. So can see first sunrise, can't see sunset. So you have can see to can't see. So at night, there was a huge amount of entertainment going on. In fact, let's see, go back here. Whoop. See, there's an accordion there on the barrel. So there was a lot of music, a lot of, of Whoops, going the wrong direction again. And here a couple of the reenactor of the interpreters uh, are singing songs to us from the time period. And if you could see the, the, the female reenactor, she's got one of those things where you tap the board and it makes it look like the little figure is dancing. So he would dance to the music. So anyway, a lot of, of simple and innocent entertainment, um, but it, it kept everybody amused during the long nights. Okay. Now here are the next themes. It's basically, there are a lot of ways you can plan a trip. Um, en route, you're going somewhere else. So you plan places along the way. You have a targeted town that you have to go to. So you find out what's in this town or general vicinity. General vicinity, I picked my own home here in the Northern suburbs and picked places that are within a half an hour to an hour of where I live. So these are, are different ways of planning a trip. So here's the first, the en route is Southern Ohio. I started the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. This is a, a must-see museum. It's, it's heart-rending and encouraging and beautiful and just so well done. It's hard to even say. They actually kind of divide places up by music as well as by walls. They, you can tell your 
what section of history you're in by what music is playing. And here you just get an idea of what it's like on the inside, just the, the level of detail and uh, just an impressive museum. Now a little further along, uh, just outside of Cincinnati, you come to Lebanon, which is the home of the Golden Lamb. Built in 1803, it's the oldest restaurant and hotel uh, in Ohio. Um, as I mentioned earlier, places that are that were posh are still posh. This place has an absolutely awesome menu. Um, it's the kind of menu where they pr print where the, the food came from because they're getting stuff from, you know, really top farms, really top providers, and uh, gorgeous, impressive menu. Although there's a section of the menu that is the historic stuff that they served in 1803, so you can actually order that. Mostly roast beef and roast turkey, but it's it's fun that you can order the stuff from the old days. Um, but it, anyway, so. 1803 and oh the thing that's fun everybody has stayed here um, it's one of those things where it's just really astonishing I mean it's it's uh Charles Dickens and incredible numbers of presidents um John Quincy Adams Ulysses S. Grant Ronald Reagan I mean pretty much anybody who came to this part of the country stayed in this in this uh hotel and one of the things that's fun is that they have restored the rooms uh, with antiques that reflect the time period of the people that stayed there. So for instance, you could stay in the Charles Dickens room if you visit this hotel. And now here's a little bit further along that Southern route uh, in Ohio. Um, this is Roscoe, historic Roscoe Village. Now historic Roscoe Village was built along the canals before the railroads came because we, we don't really realize how young railroads are. I mean, railroads didn't really, I mean, railroads weren't invented until the 1800s. They didn't really hit in America until the early 1800s. So in the early 1800s, we were building canals. Um, the Erie Canal was opened by this point in time. Um, this is the 1820s here, the canal connected. This is the Erie, Ohio Canal because it connected the Erie, Lake Erie with the Ohio River. Uh, so it made the towns along that canal very wealthy um, they, they grew quickly. Um, and then of course, when the highways came and the canals were closed, a lot of the towns sort of vanished. Now what happened here is, and this is the, a really unusual living history place in that it is still actually a living town. Um, so it's open all year, all day. And you, what you get, if you get a ticket, you get a ticket for buildings along the route. There are about a dozen buildings in town that are part of the living history aspect. So you've got the blacksmith and the broom maker and the school teacher and, but the rest of the buildings are all real stores, real restaurants. And, uh, but it all dates back to the, the 1820s when, when the canal was so important. I thought this was fun. Pretty much every place you go, there will be a blacksmith because it was so important, absolutely vital uh, to survival. But I thought this was interesting to see by color what the heat was. And so you can see um, it's yellow. So that's about 2000 degrees. And then here's part of the canal. This is one of the things that astonished me is to build the canal, they had to dig the canal carve all the stone pillars out of a nearby mountain, transport the uh, st or stone blocks, transport all the stone blocks, line the canal. Every few miles, they had to build a reservoir. They frequently had to build locks because it was not even terrain. Um, and despite all of that, it only took about four and a half days per mile. And when you think of how long it takes today with all the machines we have and everything else, how long it takes us to, to repave a, a mile of road. It's pretty astonishing that they were able to accomplish this um, one mile in four and a half days. So anyway, a lot of work. The nice thing is, is they did such a good job that there are parts of the canal that are still open. And so you can actually, this is just outside of Roscoe Village, you can actually go ride on one of the old canal boats. Um, none of the canals were deep enough to use motors and they were all surrounded by trees. So wind wasn't a possibility. Um, not that they had motors at that point, but everything was by, by drawn by horse. So anyway, so you can actually go relive that little bit of history. Now, a little further along, not far from Roscoe Village, 
is the National Road Museum. This is one of those things where I worked for in educational publishing, publishing for a long time. And it astonishes me that I never actually saw a US history book that included the National Road. And yet it's known as the road that built the nation. Uh, it was originally started by Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Uh, it started in Cumberland, Maryland, and it's sometimes called the Cumberland Road. Um, but they started in 1811. It had to pause for a little while for the War of 1812, um, but they built it across the country. It's the first federally funded highway in the country. Um, it was 66, the path was 66 feet wide and uh, came across each of the states. It ended finally by, by 1837, it ended in Vandalia, with Illinois, which at the time was the capital of Illinois. And it was paved. Uh, they used the macadam, you know, the rocks covered with the asphalt. So it was paved. So people came by the thousands. Now, the thing that's fun is there's this really fabulous um, diorama that shows you the whole length of the road. It's 134 feet long and it starts out in Cumberland, but it starts with 1811 when they're beginning to clear it. And then it goes along and you see the develop as you walk through. So here you see the Conestoga wagons uh, moving uh, east and west. Huge numbers of, of animals were moved across this. And here's just to show you, you can see the diorama in the background. And here's the Conestoga wagon. The thing that's interesting about the Conestoga wagons is that these, these were not the ones that people used as individuals moving west. Those were much smaller. The Conestogas were like your giant tractor trailers that you see on the highway now. These would hold eight tons of freight. So these were the ones that would be moving, you know, like either whole households once there was a lot more built up or all the equipment that you needed for a fort or whatever. But like I said, these were the monsters of the day. Now other vehicles, this is one of the things I thought was kind of fun. Um, they, they had convertible stagecoaches. So the stagecoach could have wheels, but it could also be converted to sled runners in bad weather. The other thing that was hailed, and I just include this, the other thing that's um, at that museum, at the same museum, it shares a corner of the museum, is the Zane Gray Museum. And the reason it's here is because Zanesville is next door and Zanesville was named for uh, Zane Gray's grandfather, Ebenezer Zane. And uh, Zane Gray basically created the genre of the Western, the genre of the Western. So anyway, the, the whole, this was, this was part of the, Zane's trace was part of the highway system. So, okay, now this, now we go on to targeted towns. That was the route that took you across Southern Ohio. Now this is a targeted town. The targeted town is Wichita. Um, Wichita is the aviation capital of the United States, interestingly enough, um, but it, it is the Wild West. It was what we think of when we think of the Wild West. Um, this is where uh, Wyatt Earp got his start as a lawman. Uh, this, is, this is the um, old Cowtown Museum. All these buildings are original buildings that were in Wichita. If you see pictures of early Wichita, you will see these buildings. And interestingly enough, Wichita grew up after the Civil War, so there is no time Wichita existed that photography didn't exist. So we really do know exactly what the things looked like, where they sat, what they did, what the people looked like, what life was like. Um, so anyway, so this is, um, all of the buildings are filled with stuff that's appropriate to the building. So if you go into the print shop, they've got the presses and they're doing the, you know, the newspapers and uh, the mortician here that's at the entrance. Um, there's the sheriff, there's all sorts of different stores. And so anyway, it was 1870s. And like I said, this was the Wild West at one point in time, meat market. But that's the thing is it was the Wild West for a blip. You know, it's one of those things, if you know anything about the history of cowboys, you'll know that they were, you know, like 10 years. You know, it was this really short period of history. It just became iconic because of the books and then because of the movies. In fact, speaking of Wyatt Earp, um, being the marshal here, when Wyatt Earp retired, he went to Hollywood to help them make movies more authentic. And he knew John Wayne. So th but that's the thing that's astonishing is how fast Midwestern history was. Um, in fact, one of the things I didn't mention earlier, but I, I always love this as my perfect example of how fast the history of the Midwest was, is that 
you know, you can't think of anyone more associated with the frontier than Laura Ingalls Wilder in The Little House on the Prairie. And Frank Lloyd Wright is like the most modern person you can imagine. They were born four months apart. Both of them in Wisconsin, both in 1867. So very, very swift um, changeover. And so it was like, even though it was old, um, civilization was coming quickly. And this is the other thing I mentioned that things are, are in all these living history venues, there are things that are great for kids, such as rides and, and things. So, oh, and this I include just because this is one of the things that's fun is in the 1850s, starting in the 1850s, there was a massive, in, uh, massive fad for oysters. And if, if you read my corn book, you'll know that there were corn oysters made when you didn't have real oysters, but oysters were being brought in by the ton um, just because everybody loved them. And that was even in these really remote towns, um, all that clean rooms, 50 cents a day. So anyway, oysters were coming in in uh, really a huge abundance. But the other thing that actually sort of underscores the, uh, the diversity of these towns is if you look at that, the Southern Hotel and the next door, can you see Turnverein at the top of that door? Turnverein is German for uh, a gymnastics club. And this is one of the things you find all over the Midwest is these gymnastics clubs. So it just shows you that it's like you've got Wyatt Earp and you've got oysters and you've got a German gymnastics club in this town. So the Midwest is just almost impossibly diverse. And that's the thing that's so much fun is the multitude of languages being spoken and just Anyway, just a lot of fun. Now here really nearby is the All-American Indian Center, which is part museum, but also part cultural center. This is where they get together for their events, but there are like more different Indian tribes in Wichita than anywhere else. I was told there between 60 and 70 different tribes. And you can see these are all the flags of the different tribes that are in Wichita. And this is one of the things talking about, once again, how they focus on the people that are um, still around. The Native Americans didn't go away. They have a picture of Maria Talchi, who was the great prima ballerina who was Native American. This is uh, from Black Bear Bozen, who became a really famous artist, worked for National Geographic, did a huge amount of, of, of wonderful artwork, and loved, he loved Wichita because there were so many Native Americans. And this is something Black Bear Bozen designed called the Keeper of the Plains, which is just outside of that museum. Um, every night that circle that you see down below has, uh, is, they have a fire ceremony. So you can come and see the uh, Keeper of the Plains still watching over uh, Wichita. And then even here, even around the Keeper of the Plains, there's a lot of information about the groups that were here and uh, what their life was like. But another thing that was an even, you know, that's the thing that's interesting. Kansas has such an interesting history because it's more about other people besides white people. Um, Kansas was determined to be, have, be a free state. Uh, one of the reasons it got known as bleeding Kansas is because a lot of people who were pro-slavery went in and um, killed a lot of, of people because they, they really didn't, of course. And then you have the really famous um, John Brown who was killing the slavers. So it's, it, was, it, it got messy, but as a result, huge numbers of African-Americans um, moved here. It was a, free, a completely free state. Cities, whole cities grew up. Uh, the only one that's still around is Nicodemus, Kansas, but there were whole cities that grew up with nothing except African-Americans. Um, as a result, almost all, the, most of the famous American, African-Americans from the early 1900s either were born in Kansas or lived in Kansas for a time. And we're talking Langston Hughes and Charlie Bird Parker and Hattie McDaniels and George Washington Carver and Gwendolyn Brooks. I mean, we think of Gwendolyn Brooks as being an Illinois person, but she was from Kansas. Um, so anyway, African Hi American History Museum um, is part of the Afri Kansas African American History Trail. So you can get a little passport and actually go the whole trail. Um, but here's inside. And like the Native American one, this is a combination of museum and cultural center. So the inside has a lot of open space because of that. Um, there's a great museum downstairs that you can kind of see, um, African Kansas, where you can see all the wood carvings and everything. But on this floor, as you go around, uh, there's a huge numbers of um, 
photographs of African Americans and events in African American history in Kansas. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting is that um, the very first successful sit-in of African Americans actually took place in Wichita. Uh, we always think of it as being in North Carolina, but North Carolina was just closer to the newspapers. So it was a place that had more people that knew, you know, what the significance was, but Wichita actually had the first successful sit-in. And some of the pictures, one of the things that was, I, I, I immediately sort of was drawn to this picture just because I knew who this was. Um, Bass Reeves is sometimes called the real life Lone Ranger, uh, more than 3000 arrests. He was such a deadly marksman that most people just, um, just gave up rather than having to deal with it. Now, the reason that I was really pleased that I saw this, I had, I had a guide for the day. Um, it was a woman who was the uh, education director for the museum. And she was really thrilled that I knew who this was. And then I looked down and realized she had just been introduced to me as Lona, but her name is Dr. Lona Reeves. So she's actually a descendant of Bass Reeves. So there's still a lot of history there in, in Wichita. And this one though, I was delighted to meet, be introduced to, because I had never heard of him before. This is Junius Groves. This, is, this goes back to my food history interest. He was once known as the potato king of the world. He grew so many potatoes that the local train line actually did a, a, a train line out to his farms because he was doing such a great job of raising potatoes. Um, and he became one of the wealthiest African-Americans in the United States. So just some really surprising, interesting histories there. Now, and this is just a final must see to tie all of the different parts of Wichita together because you have the, uh, this is the Wichita um, County Museum. And this actually used to be the city hall. So the building itself is a piece of history. And I don't know if you can see the writing on the, on the third floor window there in the center, but that's his mayor's office because that used to be the mayor's office. And inside it actually reproduces the mayor's office from the late 1800s. Um, but it ties everything together because you see the photographs of those early days and, and the Native Americans and the cowboys and the, um, the aviators. And like one of the names associated with, Worcester, uh, with Wichita is a farmer just outside of town who was inspired by the invention of the airplane. His, he, he built his own airplane. His name was Clyde Cessna. So if you've ever heard of a Cessna airplane, that started in Wichita. So anyway, it's just one of those things where it, it really pulls everything together. Now, Wichita also happens to have uh, lots of other museums, lots of other stuff to see, a terrific dining, uh, dining scene, a old town. This road that you see in front of you where you can sort of see the red truck, the one that goes under that, that actually used to be part of the Chisholm Trail. So it's just layers and layers and layers of history there. So. Now, moving on next to the general vicinity, things that are not too far from me. This one may seem like it's, it's kind of obvious to one to pick. This is in Glenview. Uh, this is the Grove. Um, I don't know how many of you may have been to the Grove, but even people I know who have been to the Grove frequently have absolutely no idea how important this was. It was built by, I mean, it's a fabulously gorgeous, um, nature reserve because the guy who built the grove, um, Dr. John Kennicott, set it aside as a nature reserve. So it's like 85 acres of pristine uh, frontier trees and rivers and everything else. It was an important site for Native Americans. Um, it was uh, just, it's, it's really beautiful. And a lot of people just think of it as a great place to go and have you know a lovely day out in the country. Um, however, the thing that makes it fascinating, if you actually um, go in, oh, I should probably also mention a lot of the places that we already mentioned, like the Mitchell Museum, the El Alakash, Long Grove, Wilmot Stage Top, are, would come within the category of places that are nearby. But the thing that makes this fascinating is Dr. John Kennicott. And this is another one of those people where you're like, how is he not in our textbooks? Um, he was the, beside being a doctor for pretty much all of this part of, of Illinois, um, in the 1800s. Um, he was the prime promoter of something that became known as the Illinois idea. Uh, eventually though, when the Illinois idea got sent off to, um, I feel like I've lost something here, but anyway, once, once the Illinois idea got sent to Washington, 
and picked up, it became known as the Land Grant Act. So if you know anything about the Land Grant Act, that was where the government set aside land for all of the state universities. So the guy who built this house is responsible for all of the state universities in the country. Um, he also started the Illinois State Fair and ran it for three years. Um, he started a magazine. He started a flower business and his descendants are still, by flower, I don't mean the stuff you bake with, but cut flowers. And the, there are still Kennecott's running that business today. He built a school and was adamant that both boys and girls be taught. And his son grew up to almost eclipse his dad because his son, Robert Kennecott, who grew up in this house, uh, became one of the first really important collectors for the Smithsonian Institute. Um, he started the uh, Chicago Academy of Science and he became so important that when the government wanted to check out Russia, what they called Russian America at the time, which is what we now call Alaska, but they sent him to Russian Ala America to um, survey it. And he came back after checking out all of the stuff and he's the one who convinced Seward to buy Alaska. So when you consider that between John Kennecott and his son, Robert, and Robert had done all of that, you know, becoming the prime, the prime collector of the Smithsonian, starting the, the, the Chicago Science Found, uh, Foundation and getting them to buy Alaska. And he was dead by the age of 30 from a heart condition. So pretty, pretty ambitious group, I think. But anyway, they, they did a lot for the country, a immense amount for the country. And if you tour this place, there's usually a costumed interpreter, but there's a lot of other buildings. It's a beautiful place and absolutely worth seeing, and it's in Glenview. Um, then, Naper Settlement. Naper Settlement is unusual amongst living history venues, and it's not off somewhere in the wilderness. Um, it's actually right downtown Naperville, so you can actually um, walk through town and look over the fence and see a lot of these buildings. It's still worthwhile to go inside because you learn so much. Naperville was a huge quarrying area, a huge amount of the stone that built the Midwest came from Naperville. Um, of course, there's a blacksmith and you can see some of the stone quarried here in Naperville in the blacksmith shop. Then you get to uh, West Chicago, Klein Creek Farm. Klein Creek Farm is interesting or is different in that it is not a collection of buildings, it is a single farm. And they recreate the whole world of farming at the time. Um, this was from uh, their farm festival, which they do each fall, where you can actually walk through the fields with them and pick the corn and throw it into the wagon that's drawn by the horse. And you can see the shocks of corn over on the side. So um, very much all of the stuff that happens on a farm is going through, but they also have a fabulous farmhouse. They have farm buildings. They have all the animals that are historically accurate animals for the time period. Um, they do cooking demonstrations and things. Uh, this is an early stove. That's one of the things that people didn't have stoves until the mid 1850s or until the mid 1800s because stoves were like huge and they were for restaurants. You didn't have a private one. So this was, this was a very early stove. And if you notice it's standing on a metal plate and that's because the whole stove would get so hot that you could set your house on fire if you uh, didn't have it protected from the wood. And then of course, all the modern conveniences you can see there on the left, the bathtub, so you could heat your water on the stove and pour it right into the, bring the bathtub down here and pour it into the bathtub. So good living. And the reason the stove was such a big deal is that up until then you used the fireplace. And, and unfortunately, when you're wearing long skirts as most women did then, it was a major cause of, of injury and death amongst women of the day was catching on fire in the stove or from the fireplace. And here we have Galena. Galena, Illinois is, Fabulous, 1826, almost the whole place is on the National Register of Historic uh, Places. Um, its original importance was lead mining. And so you can browse the shop, visit the museums. I stayed at the DeSoto Hotel, which is the oldest hotel in Illinois. Um, it's where Grant was, it was Ulysses S. Grant's headquarters during his presidential campaign. Lincoln stayed there. Uh, Lincoln spoke from the balcony. Uh, but the whole town is just is just a delight. And if you're in town and you're leaving town, try to leave on Stagecoach Road rather than the highway because Stagecoach Road 
takes you out. It's a winding road. It's, don't do it if you're in a hurry, but it winds through the countryside because it was one of the major stagecoach routes at the time. And so it, it's basically, you're looking at tiny little old towns and wonderful old farms, and it really is fabulous. And then another one just over the border in Wisconsin is Old World Wisconsin. Now, Old World Wisconsin, what they've done is all these buildings are original authentic buildings as Wisconsin has grown, they've moved them here, but they've grouped them by ethnicity because people who came over here lived with other people who spoke their language. So here there's like a, a Polish community, a German community, um, a Swedish community, a Yankee community, Yankee being people from New England. And so you have all these wonderful communities, but instead of just saying, here's a generic place, um, they actually learned the lives of the people who originally lived in these houses. So when you go in and meet an interpreter, you're meeting an interpreter who is recreating the person who actually built the house. Um, they have, you know, everything from, you know, just basically everything you'd need to survive from the butter churn, the, the uh, spinning wheel, and a wide range of houses. These are Danish. The one on the left in the back is actually the barn. Uh, the other thing that's, <coughs> excuse me, fascinating is seeing the wide variety of fences. Everybody had huge gardens because basically there was no grocery store. So you grew what you needed. And then of course you had the fences for the wildlife or for the animals and then so much more. Um, th there is so much more. And th this is just to sort of to skim over some of it. There are ships that you can take. This is a recreation of the uh, Friends Goodwill at the Michigan Maritime Museum. And not only can you crawl around it and look at it and ride on it, but you can actually crew the ship. If you get it on there, they encourage you to help pull up the sails and do the work on the ship. So um, a great way to relive the history. You could see how many states there were when this ship was built by looking at the flag. Here up in Michigan, there are a lot of lighthouses um, it, around the, the Great Lakes. So the Midwest has a vast array of lighthouses. Some of them like this one up on Mission Point in Michigan um, actually have a program where you can be a lighthouse keeper for a week. So you can actually volunteer to, you don't have to worry about the light anymore. That's all automatic. So nobody will die because you didn't make it up the stairs, but you open it up in the morning for visitors and you keep the, the steps swept off. And then you get to just wander through the woods and enjoy the beautiful ambience of the place and see the ships coming by. But um, great place for, um, for lighthouses. Here we go in Michigan also, Holland, Michigan. A lot of times the name of a town will give you some idea of who lived there, like Lindsborg in Kansas, which is known as Little Sweden. And, uh, and this Holland, Michigan, and there's a Norway, Illinois. So anyway, this is Holland, Michigan, where the, you can actually go to a restaurant that has a Dutch menu. This is up in uh, Monroe, Wisconsin. Monroe, Wisconsin is known as the Swiss cheese capital of the United States. Um, it's in Greene County, which was settled almost entirely by uh, Swiss. And so there are cheese makers everywhere. There is a cheese making museum here, um, but the Turner Hall, this is believed to be, once again, Turner is gymnast. So you remember the Turnverein, uh, which is the, the gymnastic club. A Turner Hall. This is believed to be the last Turner Hall that is Swiss. There are lots of them left that are German, but this one is Swiss. And then, of course, there's the Ratskeller restaurant where you can go down and have a beautiful Swiss cheese pie. Here we go in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, the Czech and Slovak Museum. Um, just a wonderful museum, just gorgeous costumes, fabulous history. And the thing that's interesting is that they managed to save all of these because they had to move the museum because the river flooded. This is the Cedar River. Cedar Ra River is, Cedar River gave its, its names to Cedar Rapids because there are rabbits here, just like Cedar Falls. So, but great museum. It reminds you that a lot of people came in. In fact, about a block away, you, there are still, there's a whole place called Czech Town where you can go get Czech food and Moravian food and. Cynthia? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, I think we are going to need some time for Q and A. So I, I okay, know well, I'm almost through. Just a couple of information. Okay. Thank you. This is the Athenaeum, which is a 
German place. Again, there's a restaurant here, the Rathskeller. And the reason I thought this was kind of fun is it was designed by um, Kurt Vonnegut's grandfather. Okay, so we'll just go through this. A lot of iconic stuff. This is the, uh, this was the original um, stable that the ponies left from for the Pony Express. This is in St. Joseph, Michigan. This is Fort Mandan, which is where Lewis and Clark spent the winter on the first year as they were heading west. A sod house in Nebraska, just in case you wondered. Sod houses are actually remarkably comfortable because they are like several feet deep and, and protect you from the heat and the cold. Mark Twain's boyhood home and Tom Sawyer's fence. And uh, some wonderful things you can do, just events. This is the steam show in Sycamore, Illinois. And Feast of the Hunter's Moon, which is um, in West Lafayette, Indiana, 3,000 participants. So definitely worth seeing if you want to live history. And then there we go, the end. Okay. And Princess Mays is my blog. Okay. By the way. Where are we going next? My gosh, this yeah. is great. Um, yeah, so, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to get back. But Midwest May's blog will have some other stuff, other destinations and other information. It's got a lot of farming stuff too, but it's, uh, okay, I'll shut that down. Okay. All right. So I just don't know where to go next. Um, Do we have questions? Um, I, so I, I don't have a good view to see. Um, I actually, I actually do have a question. Um, I have heard and this amazes me because um, I've been to Tikal in Guatemala and I've been to Machu Picchu and I've been to Angkor Wat. And it finally occurred to me that I should go to Cahokia Mounds since you know you can just drive there. Yes. Um, and um, I heard from a park ranger in a different park that maybe it's going to become a national park. Have you heard that? I have not. Yeah, it would I mean, be nice. It's, it's considered like a national historic site and that's the other thing too, is it's like so many of these places are connected. Like for instance, one of the things that I found out is a lot of the places I visited are part of, um, or they're not part of, but they're associated with the Smithsonian. So you can go to the Smithsonian site and find out some of these places. Like for instance, in Kenosha, one of the best Civil War museums I've ever visited. And it's, it's connected with the Smithsonian. So pretty much any place listed on the Smithsonian site as being good is going to be good. But, uh, Given so but much it's on the National Historic Register. I don't know if it will, I have, I have no insight on that. Nobody that I talked to down there said anything about that. Okay, well, we can hope. We can, <laughs> but it's worth seeing even if it isn't. I mean, it's oh, still it's already, a, you know, it's, it's, a state. It's, it's very interesting. And, yeah. and as you pointed out, there are other places that are nearby, so you can make a trip of it. So that's great. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah. Jane Hunt. Um, if um, I see you have a book coming out in 2022. Yeah. Is there a way I can be reminded a year from now that your book is out? Well, I will post it on my blog. So that midwestmaze.com that you saw at the end. Was it M-A-I-S-E? M-A-I-Z-E, yeah. Okay, Midwest So I, I assure you that I will make sure that that is on that blog unless I'm you know, dead or of gone. Course. Of course, thank you. Because yeah, else just to speak up. But it's just one of those things I think that the people just, and I mean, when I say people, I include myself. I had been to Australia four times before I saw the Chicago Botanic Gardens. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where I think even in Midwestern, you know, the Midwesterners don't think of the Midwest as a destination. Hello. Yeah. Hi, it's Helene Madsen. You're asking you about, you showed the picture in Iowa, the Iowa farm with the horse. Yes. The horse was, where in Iowa? And where in Iowa was that? Um, it's, it's basically, it's like a suburb of Des Moines. Okay. Okay. And it's called Living History Farms. Okay. And I think their, I think their website is LFH, Living History, oh, LHF, Living so History Farms. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. 
And that's that's a really worthwhile. And there's some great places in Iowa. In fact, I mean, I have a lot of places I love in Iowa, like from, you know, Claire, Iowa, where <laughs> Buffalo Bill Cody was born. To well, I know, was uh, born in Sioux City, Iowa. Okay. So the big Sioux Indian certainly were there. Sioux, Sioux City is mentioned in my popcorn or my corn lecture because, of course, that's right. where corn. The corn. Yeah. Jiffy, that's where Jiffy Pop comes from. Or right. Jiffy Pop. Um, Jolly time. Jolly time popcorn, right. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful uh, expose and your book sounds really great. Thanks again. Thank you. There are actually a couple of recipes in the book too. That's one of the things that's fun is going around and finding out that this, this tremendous variety of ethnicities produces some particularly interesting um, dishes. You know, it's like if you're, if you're in, I mean, Nebraska is, is almost iconic for that regard because there's a Russian, a Russian German dish called runza, which is kind of like a little loaf of bread with cabbage and onions and beef cooked inside. Yeah. And wow. uh, it, it's a fabulous, but it's also, it's actually the name of a fast food chain now. There are 81 runza locations in Nebraska. <laughs> Interesting, so you, thank you. You don't, you don't even have to go try and find some little obscure place to find ethnic food in Nebraska. It's like, it's right there on the main streets. That's great. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Okay, I think we're going to say goodbye now. Okay. That was a fantastic presentation. I just want to report that even though I've lived about 10 miles from neighbor settlement for the past 40 years, um, I've never been, but I'm meeting my family there on Saturday. Very nice. Well, cool. and like I said, in all fairness, I mean, I, I used to work at Scott Forsman and I drove past the Grove like every day for 20 years and uh, never went in until like four years ago. And it was like, holy mackerel, who knew? So, well, I lived in Glen Ellen for 15 years before I went to Stacy's Tavern, which is four blocks from my house. Yeah. <laughs> I've never well, been and, like and I, I said, live across the street. <laughs> Midwesterners <laughs> just don't think of, of the Midwest as a destination, but it is, and it's got fabulous history. It really and Maybe does. we can plan a trip all together. We'll go over to Greenfield Village. Great it idea. Sounds wonderful. Great idea. Thanks again. Okay, My great so I just want to remind everybody that next month we're going to have uh, Professor John Schechter speaking about the battle of, or the campaign for Gallipoli during World War I. And if you don't know much about it, as I didn't, uh, I think it's because the allies, the guys we were supporting lost that one, but it <laughs> promises, you don't hear as much about our losses, but um, you'll get more information about that with our next newsletter. So, Between him now and then, you can watch the movie Gallipoli with Mel Gibson. Yes, absolutely. I've never seen that one either, but it's a, it's a good idea. Thank you, Cynthia. And so we'll see you all next month. Okay.